Hello and welcome to my weekly podcast, Stuff You Didn't Know. In this case, about the birth stories, or maybe you did know them, or maybe you disagree with me. I missed last week. I apologize for that. Last week, I was supposed to do the appearances of Gabriel to Mary and to Elizabeth. If you want to know some of my thoughts on those, I have self-published, as you can see from the image on this week's post, I have uh, published explanatory notes on, the, on Jesus' birth, uh, which covers John 1, and also Matthew 1 and 2, and also Luke 1 and 2. And I plan to maybe do one also uh, around Easter on uh, explanatory notes on the death and resurrection of Christ. But we are still in the, w- the week before Christmas, a week from uh, today, I believe, is Christmas. And so uh, today I want to do the last part of Matthew 1. I already did the genealogies. And the first part of Luke 2. And then I'll do the wise men, Lord willing, next week on December 1st. Or the week That is the week after Christmas. No, next week. Huh. Anyway, so stuff you didn't know about Matthew chapter 1. So the first thing I want to note is that Mary is engaged to Joseph. This is serious business. This is not like an engagement. I mean, you got to cancel all the stuff uh, in our world when you cancel an engagement. But this is this is a betrothal. This is an, possibly an arranged marriage. Um, who knows? Maybe Joseph has been engaged to her for a long time. And she's just now turning 14 or 15. You know, she's just now turning uh, old enough to actually um, marry Joseph. But they're engaged. They've not had any relationships with each other. She is promised to him. It's an arrangement. Um, and she is found to be pregnant. Um, this is very serious, of course. And Joseph could um, divorce her. And it's I think it's tantamount to divorce in that culture. Um, it's a big deal. But he has a dream. And in the dream, he's told, don't divorce her. He was going to do it honorably. He was going to put her away quietly. Um, but uh, the dream tells him, no, don't do this. By the way, there's an in- interesting differences between Matthew and Luke in the birth stories. Um, we'd have we'd have a quite different flavor uh, if we didn't have the balance of, of Matthew and Luke. They're quite different um, in what they do. And it's worth taking some time to look at Matthew's emphases in the birth story and Luke's emphases in the birth story. And perhaps we'll see that as we get into the wise men uh, and such. But um, in particular, uh, Matthew focuses on revelation by dream, and he focuses on revelation by dream to Joseph. Whereas in Luke, we have the angel Gabriel, who comes to the women, Elizabeth, uh, well, actually to Zechariah, he's a guy, and to Mary. Uh, but the Gabriel comes to Mary in Luke. I've wondered, and I mentioned this in my explanatory notes, if this is a allusion to Daniel, uh, is it 9? Um, where Gabriel appears there, um, and a hint that um, something quite significant in the history of Israel is happening. Anyway, dreams to Joseph in Matthew, angel Gabriel to Mary in Luke. Now, of course, both Matthew and Luke uh, teach the virginal conception of the Holy Spirit. Now, I say virgin, I mean, we, we say virgin birth. What we mean when we say virgin birth most of the time, especially for us Protestants, is the virgin conception. What do I mean by that? Well, Catholics and Orthodox, uh, Greek, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, they believe in a virgin birth. That is that Mary's female anatomy remains intact even uh, through the birth process. That somehow miraculously, even though she gives birth to Jesus, her virginal equipment, so to speak, remains in the same. That's not usually what Protestants mean when they talk about the virgin birth. What Usually when we talk about the virgin birth, we're talking about uh, the fact that she conceived the, the zygote, the, the fertilized egg uh, of Jesus without uh, any male person or, or sex being involved. She is conceived by the Holy Spirit is what the Apostles' Creed says. That's something different than, than from what uh, uh, Catholics and Orthodox mean when they talk about uh, virgin birth. But we can still call it the virgin birth if you want. Um, I should point out that uh, although uh, Christians wrestled with it for three to four centuries, it was concluded pretty definitively in the Council of Chalcedon in 451 that Jesus is 100% human and 100% divine. It's not like uh, like there was a guy, Apollinaris, who, who said, well, you know, he's got, got a physical body, but it's a divine soul. And I think some popular Christianity 
uh, acts as if, you know, Jesus was just God in a human body. That's not really what Christians believe. Christians believe that he is fully human and fully divine. And it was very important in the first centuries not to diminish the full humanity of Jesus. There was another guy, Eutyches, who basically suggested, well, you know, his humanity is like a drop next to the ocean of his divinity. And the church said, nope, we have to take seriously his humanity. And in fact, scripture is very clear uh, in Jesus' humanity. It's actually his divinity um, that is, there is le- there are fewer verses that is there are fewer verses on Jesus' divinity in the New Testament there on a, than there are on his humanity. I'm not in any way trying to diminish his divinity here. I'm simply saying that we need to have a full sense of Jesus' humanity alongside a full sense of his divinity. He slept, he farted, he he you know he got hungry, um, and and so forth. And so he was fully human and he was fully divine. And by the way, from a genetics perspective. That means that Jesus had a human Y chromosome. It's not like, well, he gets the X chromosome from Mary and he gets this divine Y chromosome from the Holy Spirit. He gets a created X nihilo Y chromosome created from the, the Holy Spirit and it's a normal Y chromosome as far as, as far as we know. And so the miracle of the virgin birth um, uh, does not in any way diminish the full XY humanity of Jesus. Matthew says that the virginal conception of Jesus fulfills Isaiah 7.14, a virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, who calls name Emmanuel, God with us. Um, very important to realize that when Matthew interprets the Old Testament, he regularly reads it in a spiritual, fuller sense. That if you read most of the verses in the Old Testament that Matthew interprets, um, in their original context, they had a first meaning that applied for the day of the prophet, and then they had a fuller meaning that Matthew, inspired by the Holy Spirit, saw in those verses. This is true of Isaiah 7.14. Isaiah 7.14, the original promise is a promise to King Ahaz about two kings to the north who are, who are giving him a trouble. And the Lord says, I will give you a sign, Ahaz. Now, if, it, if the sign only comes to fruition 700 years later, it's a pretty lousy sign to Ahaz. No, uh, and of course, virgins conceive if they uh, get pregnant the first time they have sex. Um, and of course, the word uh, Hebrew word Alma in, in Hebrew may have a broader sense than just virgin as well. Again, I'm not trying in any way to take away uh, from the fulfillment. I'm simply saying that we have a tendency, or I have had in the past a tendency, to completely ignore the Old Testament first meaning in its own context, because I trumpet with only the New Testament meaning. We want, I want everything. I want both. I want the original inspired Old Testament meaning, and I want the fuller sense, the spiritual sense of the New Testament uh, meaning. Well, some thoughts about Matthew 1. And now, some stuff you may not have known about Luke 2, or maybe you did, or maybe you don't agree with me. So, Luke 2. Um, Josephus mentions a census as well. And there, went out a decree, uh, there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Um, and this taxing first took place when Cyrenius, or Quirinius, was governor of Syria. Interesting that the Jewish historian Josephus mentions both a census and Cyrenius. Of course, the issue is, is that he mentions it being about 6 AD, which is about 10 years after Jesus was born, if Jesus was born during the reign of Herod the Great. Now, there's different strategies that people have um, to work out these things if they're so inclined. Um, Some suggest maybe there was another census that wasn't mentioned by Josephus. Uh, Maybe Cyrenius had an earlier governorship that wasn't mentioned. Or maybe Josephus just flat got it wrong. Um, But anyway, it is interesting that it is mentioned in contemporary literature. Um, Interesting, again, if we only had Luke, we would think that Jesus went from Nazareth to Bethlehem and then back to Nazareth because... Um, um, the son of Herod was was ruling in Jerusalem. That, that of course, is probably what we would conclude. Now, Matthew doesn't tell us anything about starting in Nazareth, going south, and going going back north. Um, and so if all we had were Matthew, we'd assume that Jesus started out in Bethlehem and then only ended up uh, in Jerusalem uh, because of uh, the son of Herod ruling there in Jerusalem. Um, no room in the uh, Catalumah. 
Ah, we know the Christmas play. There's no no room, only a manger. You know that the, the he goes to the inn, and there's no room in the inn, and so they go to the to the barn. Um, Stephen Carlson has written an article uh, some years ago that I think most scholars have found convincing, and that is that the kataluma it really doesn't mean an inn. It really probably refers to a guest room, which is probably a fairly simple room. Uh, attached to the fundamental house. I was uh, reading a little bit of my mom's childhood story. She grew up in the Depression. Uh, she was, uh, her, her father taught at Frankfurt Pilgrim College uh, back in the early uh, 1930s. And they built, they, the, uh, they were in a one-room cottage, and the owner of the cottage allowed them to add an extra room. Now, I'm sure this wasn't a very big room. There were no, you know, you didn't have to get a permit to build, you know, back in the late 1920s when, when they would have done this. They just tacked on an extra little box uh, for uh, as a room for um, my mother and others to, to stay in. Um, this is probably what a guest room was like uh, in uh, the, the first century in Bethlehem. It's a, a tacked on room that really isn't a room even. It's, it's uh, big enough to sleep in, perhaps. And um, so there was no room in the guest room uh, for Joseph and Mary uh, to stay, is probably the meaning of the original here. The animals were not probably in a separate barn, but rather the animals came inside. Uh, this may have been something more like what we would call a split level, uh, where the humans kind of are um, staying on the, the, the top level, and then the animals are down in the bottom level. Um, and there's no room... Uh, for the child in the guest room, so they put him in a manger inside the house still. Very small house, probably. Uh, I have a, a huge mansion compared to the kinds of houses we're talking about in the ancient world. I don't live in a mansion. Um, but uh, the, the sizes of our houses today are frankly humongous compared to the sizes of houses even in other cultures around the world uh, and in some cities uh, these days. Um, we're very privileged. So animals in the house, no room in the guest room, probably not a tavern or an inn, probably not a separate barn. Shepherds are really low on the totem pole. These are the lowliest of the lowly. And this, um, this goes along with Luke's theme that Jesus came to include everybody. He came to include the people who are on the margins of society, people like women, people like the poor, uh, people like lepers. Uh, Jesus brought in those who are on the margins. Um, shepherds are a symbol of this. Again, interesting the contrast between Matthew and Luke. In Matthew, we have rich, wise men uh, who talk to Herod. We'll talk about that next Sunday, Lord willing. Shepherds are the lowliest of the lowly, and that's who Luke focuses on, Jesus' message to them. Um, Unto you is born this day a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Savior is a, a special emphasis of Luke that we don't necessarily get as much in the other Gospels. And of course, Christ means Messiah, the anointed one, and Jesus is the Lord, the ruler, the king. He is Lord, he is Lord. So we get some Christological titles there uh, in the end of chapter 2, or in the middle of chapter 2. You may notice that there are different translations, different versions have different things. Um, uh, peace on, uh, and uh, to men, uh, is it goodwill toward men? Peace on earth, goodwill to men. Or is it among people of goodwill? The difference here in the Greek is one letter. Is it just eudikia, goodwill toward men, or is it eudikias, to men of goodwill? Um, the, man, the best manuscripts seem to indicate that there was a missing S in the uh, manuscripts that say the King James used in the, Middle Age, in the late Middle Ages or the beginning of the Reformation Age. And so probably the original meaning was among people of goodwill. Well, there's some thoughts, random thoughts, uh, going through the first, the last part of Matthew 1 and the first part of Luke 2. Um, stuff you didn't know about Matthew 1 and Luke 2. Next week, Lord willing, we will look at um, the wise men story in Matthew 2. And if you're interested in more details, um, as I said, you can check out my uh, explanatory notes on Jesus' birth uh, on Amazon. Have a great week and Merry Christmas.